My name is Sumed. I'm a, a co-founder at Cydus Data. Uh, I'm really excited to be here at uh, Data Inch Conf. Uh, and I'm going to talk about why uh, relation databases can be at the core of your data architecture. Uh, primarily, I'm going to talk about some of the technical challenges we have to overcome to make relation databases scale. Um, and those are our Twitter handles up there. So if you're planning to tweet about the talk, feel free to tag us as well. Uh, a quick about me, uh, as I mentioned, I'm a co-founder and currently VP Engineering at Cydus Data. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, in Amazon uh, in the shopping cart team, where we owned the shopping cart uh, application, as well as the backing store, uh, which was Dynamo. And then prior to that, I was in uh, the supply chain org in order fulfillment as well at Amazon. Citus, as I mentioned, is an open source uh, database. It's an extension for PostgreSQL which provides distribution and parallelization capabilities. Simply put, it scales out PostgreSQL. Uh, that's our GitHub page, uh, so go check it out. You can download it and try it out. Uh, we also have Docker and Debian and RHEL packages. Uh, and then feel free to star our page as well if you guys are fans. And uh, I didn't capture the screenshot my colleague did. Uh, all those open tabs are, are not the way I, I manage my browser. <laughs> Uh, to start with, why relational databases? And then RDBMS, if you guys probably know this, but that stands for relational database management systems. Uh, these are your Oracle, PostgreSQL, MySQL, and the like. Uh, because your architecture could be simpler. Uh, today, companies are deploying five, six, seven different systems, one for short-term, one for long-term storage, for analytics, for caching, etc. cetera. Uh, you have the Hadoop, Kafka, Spark, and then you have plumbing to tie all of these together. And then there is a human cost as well, in terms of bringing people up to speed with these systems to uh, set them up and then manage them. But people don't realize that relational databases have a lot of this functionality already built in within them. Uh, there was a benchmark by a NoSQL uh, database a few months back uh, where PostgreSQL actually uh, outshone the rest of them. Uh, Brander from Stripe has also written a blog post about how you can implement, implement queues in PostgreSQL. And these are just a few examples of, uh, which show how relational databases can be extended for various workloads. And that's because relational database is actually a general purpose data platform. From front end to back end applications, a lot of them actually rely on relational databases. Whether you have an app or website facing OLTP application, or you need back end analytics, uh, they can really do it all. They have fast writes both real-time and bulk, at high throughput and high concurrency, and all the time maintaining data consistency. They also have very sophisticated query optimizers, which are tunable for almost any workloads and query patterns. And in fact, when you start a company or a project, uh, most of the time, relation database is your best choice. Uh, polling Y Combinator, which is a startup accelerator, uh, the majority of startups uh, at YC end up choosing PostgreSQL as their uh, database of choice initially. Uh, this graph shows uh, job postings on Hacker News uh, where they mention using a specific technology and then shows uh, how PostgreSQL is, is picking up. Uh, shows that startups that are increasingly and consistently choosing relation and specifically PostgreSQL as a database of choice. But if relation databases are so great, then why do we have all these systems? And uh, I mean, most of you, you know, sort of know some of the challenges we've had. But you know, in the last decade, as you know, some of these uh, web, social, and mobile trends took over, uh, there was an explosion of data. Right, volume of data increased. We are not talking now gigabytes; we're talking hundreds of terabytes and petabytes. And velocity of data increased as well. So we're not just not just gathering and accumulating data. We need to ingest and analyze it in real time as well. To put it simply, we needed scalable and performance systems to support these data trends. But relational databases don't scale, right? Or at least that's been the conventional wisdom. When I was at Amazon, uh, most of our uh, applications were built at the time in early 2000s on Oracle or MySQL. As the company grew, we figured out how to scale the application and the web servers but the database remained a bottleneck. So we had to build something new. We did that by actually taking away functionality. We took away the relational semantics 
and made it a key value store. We took away SQL, or the expressive query language, and provided a simple get and put API. And we also took away transactions and data consistency. The result was Dynamo, uh, which was the precursor to the NoSQL movement. But I'd argue that it's not that relation databases uh, don't scale, it's that they are hard to scale. Uh, for sure, when we needed them to scale back in the early 2000s at Amazon, uh, we didn't have uh, the know-how or the time to uh, scale SQL, scale transactions, uh, et cetera. Uh, but work and research has caught up in the last few years, and we've made uh, you know, great strides in, in tackling some of the harder scaling problems in the relation databases. So what do we need to consider when you're talking about scaling relational databases? One, uh, how do we take a table, partition that, and actually maintain some of the relational semantics that we're all used to? For example, indexes, constraints, foreign keys. Once we've distributed our data, how do we run SQL across it, especially when the SQL can be fairly advanced? And finally, how do we solve some of the heavy problems of running transactions across nodes, especially when nodes can fail. So let's talk a little bit about uh, scaling the tables. Uh, this uh, probably, again, is, is you know, something you guys are mostly familiar with, uh, but some, some of the basics of partitioning. Right? You pick a column and you pick a method, uh, typically. And then the simplest thing, but you can pick a column or combination of columns or composite keys as well. Uh, these are just a few examples, date or ID. Um, and then there's a, you pick a method, which is, could be hash or range. Uh, and again, there are, uh, there are more, there is more uh, things you can do here in terms of combinations of these methods as well. So how do we take a large table and then split it across nodes? Well, just break up the data and store it in chunks, right? But what about indexes or column defaults or constraints. One of the key early insights we had was to use the relation database as a building block itself. In this case, each node here is a relation database itself. We can then split a larger table into smaller chunks, where each chunk is a table and can have its own indexes and constraints. In fact, when you log into a worker node, you can just connect to the database inst instance on that node and then look at uh, some of those shards or partitions. In this case, we're looking at the campaigns table, and it's a shard, which is 102040. But you can see that each shard is just a mini version of the original table, uh, which has its own relational semantics. Uh, what about tables which are small? And then these are your dimension tables, or reference tables, for example, uh, nation, or region, or continent. Uh, these might have things like date, uh, currency, or language, etc. cetera. Uh, we can just keep it on one node, but in order to join, uh, typical patterns are to actually replicate this table across all your nodes. Allows us to push down joins and aggregations. And I'll talk a little bit about how we maintain consistency of these replicas a little bit later. And so far, we've talked about fairly simple relational models. right? So you have... Um, one large table, or one large and a few smaller tables, or dimension tables. But what about complex schemas with them might be tens or even hundreds of, of tables? We can look at some of the semantics of the data and the application itself, and realize natural partitioning dimensions. Consider a multi-tenant application like Salesforce. I can cre create an account, but I can only see my data and not anybody else's data. In this case, I can consider the tenant in that system. We can partition each table by the tenant ID and ensure that all the data belonging to that tenant is co-located on the same node. That means we can now push down very complex SQL because all our queries tend to be scope for a particular tenant. And this means we can also support things like foreign keys. In this example, we have an ads and campaigns uh, tables. Uh, this is ad analytics as a service. Ads has a foreign key to campaigns, which means I cannot insert an ad, which does not belong to a campaign. This allows us to lean on the database to enforce some of these application constraints. Because each campaign and ad is owned by the company or the tenant, we can add the tenant ID as part of the foreign key. We now know that uh, all the data belong to the tenant, 
lives in the same node, and we can enforce this foreign key constraint without having to look up uh, data across every node. So the key for us was using the relation database as a building block. Each worker node is a relation database itself, allows us to maintain indexes, constraints, column defaults on each node. Also, by understanding some of the semant semantics of the application, we can scale complex relational models while maintaining some of the uh, interdependencies between them. With multi-tenant applications, for example, choosing the tenant ID as a partition column allows us to maintain foreign key relationships between them and allows applications to migrate with minimal changes. So now that we've partitioned the data, let's talk about scaling SQL. Uh, so there are a few things that happen inside uh, the database when you type in a SQL query. Uh, one, there is a parser which takes this and converts that into a tree of relational algebra operators. There is a planner which takes this tree, generates multiple possible plans, and then picks the best one based on certain costs. And then finally, the executor executes it. In this case, uh, Select uh, translates to a project operator. Uh, the where clause uh, translates to a filter operation uh, or relational algebra operator. Uh, f of x can be an expression like x greater than 100. You can have join operators. Um, and then the from clause basically uh, denotes the relation we are scanning from. So how do, how do these actually map to distributed data? So the main fundamental relational algebra operator we need to introduce is the collect operator, or also known as the gather operator. Essentially what it does is reconstitute all the shards into a non-distributed form. So in this case, collect basically collects all the shards, R1, R2, uh, and so on, and we get back our original non-distributed relation. So now that we've introduced this operator, how can we use this in concert with other uh, operators? We can use some algebraic properties to optimize these plans. Uh, the first one we look at is uh, the commutative property. In mathematical terms, this just means A plus B equals B plus A. It doesn't matter in which order we apply these operations. So let's look at how we can use this. Uh, let's say I'm selecting a column X from a distributed table. Uh, the plan on the left is our first initial plan. I can introduce a collect operator, gather all the shards onto one node, and then select the column. But I can actually commute these two operations, and then first select the column from each shard, and collect only that column onto the coordinator. Both plans are equivalent, but the plan on the right is going to be much more efficient, especially if you have very wide tables. You can also look at the distributive property. Again, in mathematical terms, uh, this basically means I can distribute the, uh, uh, the multiplication across uh, the addition. And uh, how we can use it, let's look at if you're joining two large tables or two distributed tables. Again, the plan on the left is our original non uh, plan, right? So I can first collect both distributed tables onto one node and then just perform the join. But under certain scenarios, I can distribute the join across the collect operator. And what are those scenarios? Well, we talked about some of uh, it uh, a few slides back. For example, if I'm joining with uh, a small or dimension table, or if my data is co-located and I'm joining on the tenant ID. In this case, now we can perform the join on each worker node, and then only collect the results of the join. We can also look at uh, the associative property. Uh, in this case, uh, if I'm adding a few numbers, it doesn't matter in which order I add them. I can add A plus B first and then add that to C. Or I can add B plus C and then add that to A. And you know, very simply, I can use that to parallelize my aggregates. In this case, sum. So instead of uh, collecting the data and then calculating the sum, I can sum the columns on each worker node, collect the sums, and then sum the sums on the coordinator. Uh, this is, again, the simplest example. For average, for example, you would do a sum and a count. Uh, for others, you can consider things like approximation algorithms as well. 
So let's look at uh, an example query. So here I have a query. Uh, I'm doing a join with a small table. I have a few filter clauses and also aggregations. This is my uh, original non-distributed uh, tree of relation algebra operators. So I have an aggregate. I've converted uh, these into uh, specific uh, operators. I have a project, a filter, and a join across those two tables. A uh, quick aside on how actually relation databases uh, execute these. Uh, this is called the Volcano style or the iterator model. Essentially, the topmost node calls uh, next tuple, and then that call cascades down the tree, down to the join, which then scans the data, and then uh, the data basically flows from the bottom to the top. This is our first iteration uh, for uh, uh, the plan in the distributed environment. Essentially, we can just slap the collect operation on top of these distributed tables, and the rest of the plan on top essentially remains unchanged. But this is expensive because we expect these tables to be, to be large. Here are some of the optimizations that we, we do. Uh, one, we've pushed down the filters and projections uh, below the join itself. Why is this important? Well, imagine if you're joining uh, tables with billions of rows. Typically, what relational databases will do is sort both these tables and then merge them. But if I can filter a majority of rows, the planner can actually choose more optimized plans, for example, keeping one uh, relation in memory uh, and then doing either nested loop or hash joins. We've used some of our uh, uh, algebraic properties we talked about, for example, the commutative and associate properties, uh, to push down the projections. In this case, we've also amended the project with the join column, uh, which is an important note, because now we can also not just push them down, but actually modify operators to push them down. And we've parallelized the aggregate as well. So this is what the transformation actually looks like for the relation algebra tree. The important thing to note is that we've pulled up the collect uh, further up the, the tree, which means that we're pushing down computation to the worker nodes before we need to collect the data onto one single node. This means better parallelization and better performance. But how do we actually execute this uh, relation algebra tree? Well, similar to the way we can take SQL and convert that into relation algebra, we can go the other way as well. So we can take uh, a tree or fragments of the tree and convert that back into SQL. In this case, we can take everything below the collect operator, convert that into a SQL fragment, and run that on the worker nodes. And then everything on, above the, uh, the collect node, and then run that on the coordinator. And as we noted before, each worker node is actually just a SQL database. So we can run these fragments natively on the worker nodes. And crucially, each worker node can then do its own secondary optimization, which is picking the right indexes or choosing the right join methods. So the key to scaling SQL for us really was introducing new relational algebra operators for distributed processing. It allows us to deconstruct the problem into its basic theoretical form and reason about the interactions between these and existing operators as well. This gives us the confidence that our optimizer can generate sound plans. We can also introduce new operators like map and reduce. Uh, for example, if our data is not co-located and we want to do a repartition join. Relation databases have primitives, which allow us to introduce these operators, primitives to write to files or tables, primitives to move data between nodes, and to apply arbitrary computation on data as well. So let's talk about, we've talked about you know, partitioning the data uh, and then uh, parallelizing SQL across some of these tables. But one of the more complex problems we run into is transactions which span multiple nodes or multiple partitions. And if we commit in one place, how do we make sure we commit everywhere? Or if we roll back a transaction, how do we roll back everywhere? Let's use the canonical uh, you know, money transfer example. So in this case, I'm transferring money between uh, two accounts. I want to uh, make sure this happens uh, atomically in a transaction. 
And then let's say I'm a big bank, right? So I can't fit all the data onto one node. In this case, we started by account ID. And so uh, Alice and Bob's account actually live on different nodes. So these commands get issued to the coordinator first. Uh, let's assume Alice's data on the first node and Bob's data lives on the second node. So the coordinator first issues a begin transaction command to node one. It decrements uh, data from Alice's account. So at this point, can we commit this transaction on node one? Uh, not yet, because what if node two has failed at this point? Then we'd have deducted data, but not added it to Alice's account. So let's keep that transaction open and issue a second one for Bob's account. Now we update uh, Bob with that account. So now can we commit? Well, not yet, because even though we have an open transaction on both nodes, node one might have crashed at this point. So we, we, could, we would have committed on node two, but then we would have lost the transaction on node one. So how do we solve this? Uh, we actually need to do this in multiple phases, or two phases, and commonly known as two-phase commit. And again, uh, this is probably something you guys have already heard of. Uh, the first, this is the first interesting phase now, which is a prepare phase, where we prepare the transaction for commit. There are a few things that happen here, so let's dive into that. Two things happen when uh, you issue a prepare command. One, it stores the state of the transaction on disk, on durable store, such that it, be, it can be committed or aborted at a later time, even if the machine restarts. And then two, it holds the locks on the rows, such that no other transaction can modify the balance until the two PC commits or aborts. And what happens if a node fails during the prepare phase? Well, we haven't committed the trans transaction anywhere, so we can just issue rollbacks and uh, go back to where we were. But in order to progress to the next phase, the coordinator has to make sure that it gets back a prepare success from every node. And that means doing those two things that we talked about. Only after this can the coordinator move on to the next phase of the two-phase commit. And this is the commit phase where we now actually go in and try to commit this prepare transaction. In this case, what happens if a node fails? Uh, and we've actually committed the transaction in one node. Well, remember that we've stored the state of this transaction on disk. So when the node comes back up, the coordinator can go in and then commit that transaction, or if it didn't succeed, roll back that transaction. If the node is permanently gone, then we can promote a replica and commit the two PC on the replica. But assuming no failures, uh, we've committed the transaction every node. Essentially, with two-phase commit, we guarantee the transaction will either succeed on every node or fail on every node. Two PC allows us to handle failures while preserving the atomicity of transactions. And by building a distributed relation database where each node itself is a database, the nodes can handle concurrent modifications and correctly enforce constraints so that we cannot overspend. And Postgres does this actually by taking row level locks. But we also have a problem, deadlocks. As we mentioned before, uh, Postgres SQL ensures consistency on a single node by taking row level locks. But this can also cause deadlocks. With complex and concurrent transactions, deadlocks can be a concern. These have to be solved before you can handle workloads of increasing complexity and scale. If not, clients will remain hanging until killed by the application and your throughput will reduce. So let's walk through how this would happen. Uh, again, the same money tra transfer as an example. A session one comes along and uh, updates uh, the balance for Alice. In this case, Postgres SQL takes a row level lock on the row for Alice. Session two comes along and updates the balance for Bob. It acquires a row level lock for the row for Bob. At this point, nothing is wrong, and no one is waiting on anybody else. Session one 
then tries to update the row for Bob, but it cannot do so because session two holds the lock for that row. So session one waits, waiting for the lock to be released. Session two then comes along and tries to update the row for Alice, and it cannot do so because session one holds the lock for that row. Now both sessions are waiting, other, waiting on each other, and we are deadlocked. No progress can be made at this point. So you would ask, like, don't relation rate bases already solve this? Well, they do. And the way they do that is actually construct a directed graph of the sessions or transactions. In this case, each node in this graph is a, a, a transaction, and each directed edge represents that transaction waiting on, on, on another one for a lock. Now you can run standard cycle detection algorithms in this graph. This is the simplest example, obviously, uh, but you can imagine more complex scenarios with tens or hundreds of transactions. When the cycle is detected, you know there is deadlock, and you can make the decision to kill one of these in order to make progress. Uh, but does that work in distributed environments? Uh, this actually shows what a deadlock would look like in a distributed database. If you look at any individual machine in this uh, picture, there is no deadlock. On node one, session two waits on session one, but it doesn't seem to be blocked on anything else. So post the sequence deadlock detection is not going to work by only looking at information on one node. You need a distributed deadlock detector. We need to associate each session with a globally unique transaction identifier. The global de deadlock detector then dumps these weight graphs from each node and constructs a global lock weight graph on the coordinator. We can now look for cycles in this graph, and in this case, we decided to kill session two so that session one can make progress. So we've seen that uh, scaling transactions needs two PC and deadlock detection, allows us to maintain correctness and scale to multiple sessions running complex transactions. We haven't touched on some of the benefits that a single node relation database gets us. For example, MVCC, which gives us concurrency on a single node as well as, as, well as isolation. We also haven't touched on failure handling uh, that much, but you can use things like Raft or Paxos to create highly available replica clusters. Uh, but relation databases come with a rich set of replication and HA capabilities, allowing you to configure replication across various nodes in various topologies. So how do we, we've talked about scaling tables, scaling SQL via distributed relational algebra, and transactions via 2PC and deadlock detection. How do we implement all of this without spending another 20 years building a relational database from scratch? The answer for us really was just PostgreSQL. PostgreSQL has a very modular code base. Uh, this has led to a lot of forks of it. Uh, for example, um, Redshift, is a fork of Postgres from several versions back, as was uh, Greenplum. This modularity was later formalized and commoditized in the form of extension APIs. You can now replace any parts of the query execution pipeline, from the planner to various parts of the executor. For example, you can change the storage, storage mechanism using the foreign tables API, and we did that to add columnar storage. Or you can use the transaction callbacks to provide some of the distribu distributed transaction guarantees that we need. And we've noted various points we're using PostgreSQL as a building block. Citus is an extension which provides some of the distribution parallelization features. So not only are we using it as a building block across uh, various nodes, but even on a single node, we can intercept parts of the, of the query execution pipeline and rely on Postgres to perform other parts, for example, query parsing. And that's because PostgreSQL is not just a database, but it's an ecosystem. Citus is just the distribution layer in this ecosystem. There are extensions like Postgres, which is one of the largest geospatial libraries out there. PostgreSQL also has JSONB, which is a binary JSON type, fully indexable for fast lookup. It has things like full text search, custom types and aggregates, list notify mechanisms, and so much more. And what this means is that PostSQL can be extended into an all-purpose distributed relation database. You can take these extensions and features 
and mix and match them to adapt PostSQL sql to your use case. If your data was small enough, you could always do that on a single node. With Citus now, you can distribute the data and parallelize your queries, thus scaling to your future data needs. Postgres has been in development for about 20 years, uh, but the development is just ramping up. In Postgres 10, we got features like parallel queries, logical replication, and declarative partitioning. And there's much more in Postgres 11. When the need to scale arose with the rise of web, social, and mobile networks, there was no time to re-implement uh, some of the functionality of relational databases. No SQL was born. But as applications have become more advanced, so have relational databases. Postgres, in particular, allows you to deploy a scalable, extensible, open source relational database with distributed queries and distributed transactions across both unstructured and structured data of any size. Thus, the future of your data architecture might just be one big Postgres cluster. Thank you. Do I understand right that to get all of those nice features on top of Postgres, you just were able to do it with existing extensions and mm -hmm. just combine them in the right way? Yeah, so Citus itself is an extension of mm -hmm. Postgres SQL. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't fork Postgres SQL, so we stay up to date. You can basically install Postgres SQL at Citus, so you get all the features of Postgres, and then Citus provides the distribution and parallelization features as well. Do you have the anywhere published a specific recipe for like the you know to break down the, the features that you described and what would be the extensions to do it, or is it just all the what you had on the slide? Uh, so uh, we are not uh, so we we provide one extension. Uh, uh, not all extensions are provided by us. So it is an ecosystem, right? So uh, I think there is uh, a website called PG extensions, something like that, which, which has a list of all the extensions uh, available and the kind of uh, features they provide as well. OK, last, last question. Thanks. So have you tried to benchmark using some kind of like standard things such as TPCH or let's say for a transaction, TPCE? Yeah, so actually, if you go to our, uh, our documentation, we have instructions on uh, uh, on some of the benchmarks, uh, so you can actually uh, run those. Uh, we tip, like the instructions currently have uh, PG Bench, uh, so you can run PG Bench and compare that to sort of regular single node Postgres as well. Uh, for uh, queries, what we typically see is, uh, you know, on a single node we are limited by Postgres SQL's performance and tuning, uh, but because we parallelize that, we sort of scale linearly as you add CPU cores and machines. <laughs>